Indian, classical Indian dance. So as a novice, you wouldn't understand the story, but you still see and recognize there are gestures, but you don't exactly know what the gestures mean as well. But it showed that if you see it live, that is enough for, you, for the audience who is not experts to still engage with it on a sensory motor level. But when they watch it on video, it's not. Because also what we noticed as researchers, and this is anecdotal experience, if you do the testing, um, is that actually the performers did the performance slightly different each time, not just because the movement, the pirouettes went better, or they were a bit less tired or more tired, but because they responded to the audience. And we could see that most in the classical Indian dance, that there was a real kind of interaction between the performer and the audience. Which normally we, in cognitive neuroscience, we wouldn't test unless there's a specific experiment for that. But otherwise we would want to just keep it as neutral as possible and the performance should look the same every time. So now with having been in the pandemic, it's really interesting to think about this as well again, where everything was suddenly on video and experiments are now being done even more on video, but it is not the same thing for the spectators to see something live. And then you can think about the interpretation of artifacts, what this means, because all we have back from the antiques is the text that you work with or the images that we have, but we don't actually have the live performances as we know for sure how they were. But I, I heard that there were kind of some reconstructions that people are trying to do. So something of our work for you um, to think about, um, I went too fast. So I discuss the, the research I do under the, the umbrella term of kinesthetic cognition. And what I want to say with that is the focus is on the kinesthetic sense, so the sense of the movement, which affects our ways of thinking and feeling as well as seeing. And the sense of movement is closely linked to our understanding and the interaction with the world around us. So I think I have this later at some point, but some of you might already think about, well, what's then the difference to embodied cognition? And the term kinesthetic cognition, I use to specifically focus on the sense of movement rather than of the, the idea of how having a body and living in a body influences the way we interact with the world. It's, the experience, the feeling of movement. Um, so we have the visual sense, we have the auditory sense, taste, smell, touch, and proprioception. Of all of these, um, it's really the visual sense, which in cognitive psychology is regarded as the dominant sense or treated as the dominant sense. And yes, it's approximately 85% of our perception uh, and thought related processes are mediated through vision. So it is, is a really strong uh, sense and it's the most studied sense in psychology. And uh, it helps us to also coordinate our uh, motor interactions. I have here a picture, an illustration from Rene Descartes' pineal gland assumption, which is interesting because at that time, it was already known that actually this pineal gland is not responsible for our visual sense. But what was interesting is that the explanation used was that it's also including the sense of movement, which later than really when people were studying the visual sense is very much focused on the visual sense and movement came in later and the sense of movement is kind of almost a bit distracted uh, from it. So to give you an idea, of the kinesthetic sense I'm talking about here, which I describe here as the forgotten sense, is that difference, there's a small difference between proprioception and the kinesthetic sense, uh, which just to start with, um, I wanted to agree on what I mean when I talk about kinesthetic sense in particular. So if you use your visual sense, which is the most accurate sense, and you try and touch the two uh, fingers, you can do that, all of you, yeah. You use your visual sense to put them together. But if you do it on top of your head, you cannot use your visual sense, but still quite a few are able to do that. So what you use for that is proprioception. Yeah, You know where in space your limbs are when you try and kind of feel the position of your limbs in space. So if you do that again, and come down, 
you all know when you came down, you did it. You have a sense of the movement doing it. So the proprioceptive sense focuses more on the position of the limbs in space and the kinesthetic sense more of the sense of the movement that you did. It's a small difference and it's not used equally um, by all researchers. So the visual sense is the most accurate sense. I mentioned that and then illustrated this. But when dancers are performing on stage, they cannot always rely on the visual sense. So they have to know where the limbs in space are without always looking at them. So we did a study looking at dancers' um, understanding and acuity when they had to point to positions on the table above from underneath where they wouldn't see where they would be touching. And in one condition, they could look at the point on the table they were touching at. And in another condition, they couldn't, so they were blindfolded and the experimenter would put the hand on different points on the table. Um, and in other places, in, other, in another condition, they were just looking at the point and touching from underneath without using the other arm. And what you can see in this figure is how accurate uh, participants are. So these are experienced dancers on the left versus non-dancers on the right. And the higher the bar goes, the more further away from the location where they should have touched they were. So you can see a huge long black bar in the condition where there was only proprioceptive information available for the non-dancers. So when they weren't allowed to use the visual sense, they are not very accurate in where they touch from underneath the table. So the proprioceptive sense is not very accurate. But in the dancers, it's, it's much more. So the dancers have a trained proprioceptive sense, so they're more accurate. But still not as accurate as when they can use vision in addition to the proprioceptive sense, because the visual sense is really the most accurate one. However, when we looked at the pattern on how they were touching, then when they use the proprioceptive se sense alone, they use a different way of trying to match, similar to as the non-dancers would use the visual sense. So the error matching pattern that they did was different, as if the dancers would rely on the proprioceptive sense when they could use vision. So overall, they were more accurate with the vision, but the error pattern was more like what you would have in a proprioceptive sense. So almost like, yes, vision is more accurate, but actually I wanna feel it. I wanna kind of overshadow the vision with the sensing of the body rather than uh, the more accurate one. And that I thought was, was rather interesting to see. So we rely on the kinesthetic sense quite a lot and we can train it to rely even more on it. And the senses influence each other like we heard this morning, uh, Michelle talking about. So the kinesthetic experience comes through the visual uh, sense a lot. So when we see it sit in a train and we see the other train moving, so all the visual information goes in one direction we almost feel as if we were moving, even if we stay still and the other train is going in the other direction. So that's one of those illusions of self-motion effects. We have a motion after effect. For example, when you look at the waterfall going in one direction for a long time and you fixate at one particular point and then you move your head away to another direction, you look at the tree, you have an effect as if the tree would grow in the other direction. So I can see some of you nodding. So you, you've done that. If you have never done that and you go on a hike where you can see a waterfall do it, it's really quite an experience. And also we can just look at still figures like artifacts from the antique that imply emotion in ourselves. So even if the picture is not moving at all, we can sense movement and that's described or under the term of uh, implied motion. So we are very good at seeing motion, even if there's none. And not just when there are bodies, like on the left-hand side, but also in artworks where they work with objects. We can almost feel this explosion happening as illustrated here in the figure. And in one study, I looked at psychology students who had some tra dance training and others who had none at all. And just one year of recreational dance training enhances the kinesthetic experience of the viewer when they look at bodies in motion, so at photographs of dancers. 
So it doesn't need a lot to enhance this experience internally when you just look at still, still images. So yeah, we, we are very good at seeing motion even when there is none. And in a way, what, what this example illustrates is that the brain is really relevant for movement. Um, this is a picture of a sea squat. Um, this is uh, um, an animal in the sea moving around. And as soon as it settles in one particular place, it eats its own brain. So it's used as an example. As long as we are moving, we need our brains. If we say stay settled somewhere, that's not needed anymore, so we can uh, nourish ourselves from it. So brain is relevant for movement, but what is the role of the sense of movement? So why do we have that sense of movement? Why, why is it needed for our thinking, feeling, and maybe verbalizing? And this is where kinesthetic uh, cognition comes in. So the assumption or the prediction is that it is so important uh, the sense of movement, either in an active condition when we do move, or when we are audience as passively uh, experiencing movement but without moving for our perception and cognition. And factors that can impact the sense of movement, I've already talked about expertise and familiarity a little bit. And then of course, our coherence, spatiality and respiration, uh, which I'm going to outline a bit more. But before I go there, just a brief kind of introduction of what type of measurements we use when we look at brain activity. One of the most common measurements we use is a, a scanner, a magnetic resonance imaging scanner, MRI, which you can see on the left. If you have not been in one already, um, it's not a very comfortable experience for the participant. It's great as a tool to see the brain in action or to see the structure of the brain but it's very noisy. So the magnetic pulls and the field is really loud. So you have to protect your ears. So you, if you want to hear sounds, it's a bit more difficult to do in the experiment. And it feels very claustrophobic because you have your head fixed and you can't really move your, your body when you're in the scanner. So it's amazing that it's a non-invasive method allowing us to see the brain in action, but it's not too comfortable an environment to be in for a long time. I, after I'm nervous when I'm in the scan, I normally almost fall asleep in experiments <laughs> because you then try and relax so much that, uh, and in this environment, you can get tired. And in the middle, you can see an anatomical scan that can be done in the scan. And on the right, you see like red blobs on the brain, which are through statistical analysis, looking at where does the blood flow change in a manner that you can make an assumption. These are the areas that are more activated when the participant does uh, engage in a certain task. So that's a functional scan or short fMRI. And most of the research in the area I work with or on the observation of dance is based on the um, protection of the mirror neurons by uh, an Italian research team, Rizzolatti, in 1996. And it's a coincidental finding. So you might all have heard about the mirror neurons, but I'll just go quickly through so that we are on the same page. So the, res the researcher group studied the motor execution of monkeys. So they were invasively measuring the activity of neurons in the motor area of the brain. And then when the experimenter placed a piece of food, what they noticed is that neuron was firing as well, even though they were just interested in the neurons when the monkey was actually executing an action. And the explanation the researchers then had was, well, it's like a neuron that mirrors what the monkey would do as an action when they just see an action from somebody else doing. So mirror neurons are neurons that fire both in action execution and action observation. And it was a coincidental finding in monkeys. Um, and you can see here, um, just on the right, an illustration of, of the mirror neuron activity. And at the bottom, you see the spike of, of the neuron activity when the experimenter places a piece of food. And of course, a larger spike still when the monkey then grasps that piece of food. And where in the brain areas were where they de detected mirror neurons. So it's not all neurons in that area have these properties. Is a certain percentage of the neurons that do have that. And of course, the next question is, well, 
do they exist in humans as well? And from a theoretical basis that you're probably familiar with, that was not new. Like the assumption that we have an internal simulation or a kinesthetic response when we passively watch other people moving, that existed before 1996. But this was kind of the first time it was taken up because we had some kind of insight into what's happening in the brain and could kind of specifically locate the areas where that activity happens when we passively watch other people moving. And some of those activities are in areas of the brain where we would expect motor execution uh, to be happening, but also other areas. And tense is a very good way of studying um, this because it's object unrelated and you have different levels of expertise and you have different types of tense. So it, it gives you a var variety of ideas of how you could test the mirror neural network in humans. Um, there is a seminal study by Beatrice Calvo Marino and colleagues in 2006, where they looked at the activity of the brain of professional ballet dancers and pro professional capoeira dancer, which is a Brazilian fight, fight style uh, of dance. When they watched clips of their preferred dance style and the other one in the scanner. And they also had novices in the scanner watching those dance styles. And the clips were really just three second video clips. So it was more like ballet actions or capoeira actions rather than what we would describe as dance. And here in red, you can see where experts have more activity when they watch the movements they are expert in. So for example, ballet dancers watching those three second clips of ballet dance repeatedly. And you have like motor areas and you have um, superior temple sulcus areas. So here, um, the superior temple gyrus is more like for auditory activity or multisensory integration normally. But you have a network of areas to start with. But also what is important to remember, I said in the scanner, you can't move much. So actually the dancers just passively observed these actions, they weren't moving. So it's not the mirror neurons, it's the action observation network to be a little bit more correct. And also what I thought was really interesting uh, with this study is, if I think of dancers watching movement their expertise in, shouldn't they have an even stronger sensory experience of those movements? They really feel how it feels like doing that movement. And that sensory somatosensory experience would be in the somatosensory cortex here, which you can find in the study below, which is really large highlighted there, but not so much in the, in the seminal study by Beatrice Colo Marino. And one of the differences between this, these two studies is that the one at the bottom by Christian Kaisers and Valeria Gazzolo, they measured participants' brain activity during action observation and action execution. So they had small movements like holding a cup, bringing it to the mouth, or watching a video of a cup being brought to a mouth. So these were really the mirror neurons, where in the brain is activity in both conditions for each individual participant, and then taking all the participants together. Whereas in the ballet study, it was really all the participants, the expert ballet dancers watching expert ballet movements, but not executing any of those movements and not looking at the areas which are specifically activated for both of them. So there's a huge difference in how um, the study's been done on what you actually can find and conclude from it. So that's, that's basically the main point I wanted to get across here. So that's the introduction so far. Now I'm coming to the kinesthetic cognition examples of coherence, respiration, spatiality that I came across in my research and found seem to be really specific in how it influences the way we see or perceive movement. So the first on coherence is a study that I did with uh, Azef Bachrach and Christoph Pallier in Paris where we had ballet dancers in the scanner watching different clips of contemporary, no, not ballet dancers, professional contemporary dancers watching clips of professional contemporary dance. Those clips were modified in the way so that we had samples of movements that were coherent. So they were like building a coherent string of movements or that were scrambled up 
at different levels. And I can just show you um, two examples here to give you an idea. So you hopefully have seen that always two small clips were kind of continuous, but then there was a new movement from somewhere else. So there is some coherence in there, but not a complete coherence over all the clips. And I give show you another example, which I think is the same. And we had this interruption from the small clips for all of them, even when it was fully coherent. So just for experimental reasons, so that each participant would have this kind of interruption, whether the condition was coherent or not. Yeah, so that was kind of an experimental way of making it more similar between the different levels of coherence. And what we found was that then the spectators who were experienced dancers watch these different clips. The more coherent the clips were, the more activity they had in BA44. So that probably doesn't tell you much. What is BA44? Um, it's an area in the frontal part of the brain, uh, or may, you might have heard Broca's area as well. So it's long thought to be an area where we process language and structure and grammar. And Recently, like with this study on dance, but also other studies on gesture and music, showed that actually this area is a model. So it's not necessarily be linked to language alone, but it has to do with structure, like the grammar of things. So whether something is more coherent or not. So something I thought might be of interest for you when you base um, your analysis on text artifacts from the antique, how kind of do we make meaning of that and how can we create coherence and if there is a coherence that is related to movement maybe um we have in the reading of those texts a different engagement with it but that's just me speculating here um the other element or factor that i recently i'm really interested in is respiration and that's based on the project on kinesthetic empathy i was working on with scholars from the humanities uh, the Reynolds and Matthew Reason, artists, as well as other cognitive neuroscientists. Kinesthetic empathy is understood as the ability to experience empathy merely by observing the movements of another human being. And um, so kind of to feel for that. However, we have never in this project, if I remember correctly, um, really looked at the levels of empathy. What we looked at was kind of the kinesthetic response um, and <laughs> Maybe I'm not quite correct because Matthew and he did some interviews where they might have looked more closely into kind of the empathic response of audiences. But we looked at levels of expertise, then the live video example showed you earlier was one of those projects. And we looked at the influence of the audio, like how is the music or the rhythm that audiences hear integrated with watching movements? And one of those studies was with Rosie K, where you can see a picture here from one of her performance, where you can hear the performers breathing. It's the performance was influenced by a dance company in Amsterdam, Emil Greco. I worked with and collaborated with over many years. And it's a very visceral way of moving. They work a lot with the breath. And I find it really fascinating. And when we had our interdisciplinary team discussions and meetings, we realized within the team, but then also when we did more research with audiences, it's almost like the audience seems to be split and the team as well on whether we like watching a performance where we can hear the performers breathing or whether we don't like that. So we thought that was really interesting and some fun, something we wanted to investigate, which we did. So Rosie Kay then created material that had like an introduction and an ending and three sections in between that were exactly the same or as much as they could perform it the same. Ones with a classical sound score from Bach, 
Once with no music, where they try to amplify a little bit their respiration, so the audience could really hear their levels of exertion. And once with a, um, a modern electronic sound score. And we had this as a live performance. Also, we then used the Bach and the briefing to look at audience's response in the scanner. And the live performance and the interviews showed again, it's like really half the audience love it. They're like, yes, I like to hear that. It's really visceral. I can maybe with this desire of longing for the performer, I can really think myself and get that connection with the performer. And for the other half of the audience, I was like, no, 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 that's far too close. I just want to have like visual, auditory, beautiful thing to watch from a distance that I don't want to ooh, engage in that so much. And then in the scanner, we found um, a little bit of the following as well. This is a different way of analyzing the data. And I'm just looking a bit at the time, um, how much I go into this. So normally, I try and do this quickly. Normally in fMRI research or generally, we look at differences between watching ballet or capoeira, for example, or between seeing an image and seeing a text. Here in this way of analysis, we look at audience's brain or participant's brain over time when they watch something that lasts longer and how do the different neurons in the brain activate or deactivate, said like in a, in a very simplified way. So the first study was looking at audiences watching a film, 20 minutes excerpt from the good, the bad and the ugly, and then looked at where in the brain of those five participants are neurons that respond significantly in a similar way during that performance. Um, and then they found that yes, in the visual area we have, but also in the audio visual integration and also in some other areas where neurons are the same of the audiences when they watch the film. It's as if the film directs their brain activity. Yeah. And then we use this method as well to look at where in the audience's brain is activity at the same time going up or going down when they watch this Rosy K performance with the Bach or with the respiration. And what we find is that when you have it with music, so with the Bach, you have similar activity over time in participants in the area that we know processes audiovisual integration. So yes, it's not very exciting somehow to be expected. So the audience pleasure comes through kind of finding convergence between the audio and the visual. But without music, we found areas that we know are more related to bod uh, processing bodily information. So it's more posterior, but also in other areas where the body has a greater influence when interpreting dance uh, with the stimuli of the breath. So it's almost like the bodily areas of the brain are more correlated amongst participants when they hear the breathing. So in another way, there's some evidence here that yes, the areas we know are important for processing physical and bodily sensations and recognizing bodies is orchestrated by the performers when they make their breathing audible to the audience. Uh, another study I did based on this is what I call some like it hot, because I really found this fascinating that half of the audience love it, the other one hate it, and there's rarely anybody who is unsure, um, which we normally don't find so clearly in our research. So I had people watching it uh, on a screen, so not live, but recorded, and they had to do some personality tests. And participants who score higher on the personality tray of openness, they like this hearing the performance breathing more. So it's related to kind of who you are and what your preferences are and what your personality traits are, whether you like one or the other, whether you engage with a performance in one way or another. It's, this is new for, or was new at the time for dance and respiration, but we know that personality um, traits have an influence on how we process music or art. So from that point of view, this is not something that was very novel. So people who are score high on openness and extroversion often enjoy more contemporary art or enjoy more um, um, 
the opposite of classical music, crazy chess <laughs> uh, music, for example. Disco. It depends on which type of disco. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's, it's, in a way, it was quite novel to look at the respiration from dance performances, but the, the approach and the understanding is not so new in, in other art forms. Then the last point I wanted to make is in regards to spatiality. And this is something that, like the respiration, was really close to my heart. Because this was a study, so you see here a brain with two small blobs, uh, visual and more motor areas. And what they represent is increased activity when novices in the scanner watch movements they like more. So the data from the scanner was taken from the previous study I showed you with the ballet and capoeira dancers. And then we asked the novices to come back into the lab again a year later and just watch the videos again and say how much they like it on different dimensions like uh, preference, liking, how much arousing they found it and so on. And then we used the dimension of the liking and looked for average liking. So these were like videos on average the participants liked most. If they did so, then they have more activity in motor and visual areas in those two blobs that you can see here. When I look at those videos, I can see that those that are liked more seem to have a tendency to be more like vertical movements, like jumps or like big changes in the leg going over. Whereas the ones that were liked on average less um, have a more tendency to be more like horizontal swaying type movements, which I really find interesting. So when I dance um, and I do contemporary dance and other styles, like the viscerality for me is very strongly linked with the verticality of the space, like going to the floor, jumping up, for me feels very different than kind of the swaying type movements. So I was really interested in looking at this a little bit more. And we took um, the archive of a British dance photographer, Chris Nash, with his approval, and had um, dance students rating the direction of motion they go in. So there is an implied motion in those images, that in those examples here, even though they're both jumps, one example I took is ex perceived as an implied motion in the horizontal, the other one is perceived as an implied motion in the vertical direction. And those photographs where participants in the pilot study agreed to 75% were then used for the study with the psychology students who either had some dance experience or had none. The participants saw these photographs, like many of them, and they're very colorful. So this is just two examples that are black and white. And as that they had to respond to them and how much they prefer them, how likely they would hang them up at home, how much it makes them feel as if they were moving. So that was the kinesthetic question, sorry, and, and so on. So several different questions. And what we found here in the figure for black, you see the responses for those participants who had some dance experience. And again, this is not much, this is just at least one year of recreational dance class experience. And in gray, the students with no experience at all. And of, on the left, you see the responses to the horizontal and the right to the vertical implied photographs. And this is just for the question of how much do you feel the movement yourself just looking at those pictures. So the kinesthetic question. What we can see is that for the vertical movement, there is a significant difference shown here in red between those with experience and those without, meaning the bar for experience is higher. So people who have a little bit of dance experience have a stronger kinesthetic sense when they look at stills that imply a vertical motion compared to uh, those who have no experience, but also compared to the horizontal. Yeah. So a little bit of dance experiences changes the way you look at dance photographs and the way you feel them while you look at them in regards to the direction, but also in comparison to those who have no experience. We also ask participants to point on a body figure with the mouse where they feel it. And then they had a stronger sensation in the center of their body reported to us when they see photographs that show an implied motion in the vertical uh, rather than the horizontal. And here just another two examples of those uh, kind of very 
colorful photographs that the participants saw. So I chose those examples today because I was thinking of what are the, what is the link I have in my research to the antique? And that is in regards to um, life versus non-life or text-based or kind of the, the images that we read and try and interpret. So kind of how we use our own experience and the sense of movement to look at those potentially visceral artifacts or less visceral artifacts. Overall, we need to remember that dance, although it is a visual component, is fundamentally a kinesthetic art whose appreciation is grounded not just in the eye, but the entire body. And that's quite, quite a well-known um, description from Dolly. And I said the most important things about my research, and hopefully we can use some of the ways I thought what I did in my studies and experiments that you can take something from the antique and bring it back to me in the discussion, hopefully. Just to add a little bit, um, what I also do is um, bring my practice-based experience into some of the work we do, like here is an example of an interactive installation that I created with um, a colleague at Apathe who is in the games and computing design department, where we try to kind of use the knowledge of the kinesthetic response and the audio integration into the space with this interaction. And it was, it was successful with young people and children, less so with the middle-aged or older generation for whom we actually wanted to do this installation. So we wanted to get them to move more. And I still think today, one of the reasons is that the audio wasn't as well worked through as I would have liked to. So for example, respiration or audio stimulation wasn't uh, as well worked with. Also, I recently did a one minute uh, commission for a dance film with Panel Spence and Zoe, a uh, colleague from other universities where we used the knowledge there from their artistic fields and me from the research to create um, a kinesthetically moving one minute dance experience. And I think for me, the most moving bit was also that it was happening during the pandemic. So we wanted to do the filming like on the first week the lockdown was happening. So that was kind of <coughs> over all the time. And that I see lastly the importance of the sense of movement over the lifespan. So all the studies I was talking about today were really just for students or the adult population. But what I'm interested in is using it as well for rehabilitation, like, for example, ones for Parkinson's, uh, but also for uh, children and how they engage with spatial tasks, for example, whether they have a sense of movement trained early on in life, food on or not, and some work that I did with actors. And I reached the end of my presentation. Thank you and everyone else who was involved. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Cet exposé I passionnant. I um, hope it was not too much. <laughs> mais non. Um, comme on a commencé avec un petit peu de retard, il uh, y avait une poste prévue. Vous y tenez, on peut peut-être prendre cinq minutes le temps de faire la transition. Voilà, mais. Uh, un quart d'heure complet pour bien garder du temps pour la discussion à la fin de, de la séance. Voilà, donc juste le temps de... Uh, we, are, we are taking five minutes. Uh.